All right, so T cell recognition and subsequent activation is almost nearly always fatal to the pathogen. Now, pathogens have ways of blocking these mechanisms, and, and uh, for example, like TB that survives inside of, it resists phagocytosis, but if it were to say, actually uh, result in T cell activation, even multicellular parasites cannot survive that type of a response. So this is the most effective means of killing things. Virally infected cells are destroyed, macrophages are going to be activated to kill bacteria, and then B cells are going to be activated to produce antibodies capable of eliminating and neutralizing the pathogen, removing it, whatever process that we're talking about here. And the invading pathogens are constantly going to be uh, under a selective pressure to adapt. Um, now, it's not just mutation that they're doing. They also have, like, you know, plasmid exchanges. Um, remember, py parasites can have sex, and even certain uh, viruses can swap DNA and things like that. And so they're collectively uh, constantly adapting to this uh, selective pressure, such as the host immune system. So obviously, we have to have a large range of things that can bind to the MHC class 1 and therefore can be presented to some of the T cells, CD8 or CD4. Um, and while we said that there wasn't like somatic recombination, there wasn't somatic hypermutation, they don't have anything of that. What they have though is genetic polymorphism. They have a lot of different, more than one wild type trait for them to work with here. There are six classes for the one, and then there are five pairs, alpha and beta, for the class two genes, okay? So each MHC molecule is said to be promiscuous, which we talked about that earlier. This means that it's capable of binding to different peptides of approximately 10,000, which sounds like a lot, but in reality, it's, it's not like every peptide in the same. So they're really selective, but at the same time, the binding is, is not as, say, constricted as certain certain other things are. This is just a, another diagram showing you the gene arrangements for uh, the class 2 region here. This is all on chromosome 6, I believe. This is class 2 region, the class 3 region, which doesn't, we're not really talking about that so much, and then the class 1 region, which is associated with the MHC receptors. So, um, Polymorphism is something where there are multiple alleles of a given gene, which makes sense, right, that there would be this. So each variation binds to different peptides controlling antigen presentation to cells. So this is something that you may want to take note of, not necessarily the HLA, whatever, isotypes, but the fact that we do have highly polymorphic things where we have a huge amount that we can choose from that we want this receptor to be, especially for HLA and HLA-B. Um, just so that you know, these HLA things, these are the same thing as saying MHC, but this is the MHCs of humans. This is what we're talking about here. So there's highly polymorphic in red, polymorphic, which we see illustrated in green, oligomorphic, and then monomorphic. Um, we'll talk about the, the, the significance of each of these later. Um, but this just gives you a, a idea to see the numbers here by the MHC classes, the loci, and then the number of allotypes for each and every one of these, which is pretty darn large for some of these at least. So this is so like so HLA A, right? that has 506, that's highly polymorphic. HLA-B, that has 872, that's highly polymorphic. And then once we go to E, it kind of, kind of just drops off and going so far and, and so much in this fashion here. Um, let's see if we can't see another diagram to illustrate this point here. So for class one, there's alpha ABC present on peptides of CD8 uh, helper T, or cytotoxic T cells, sorry. E and G are gonna interact with natural killer cell receptors. F is an intracellular thing, which we haven't quite understood what it does is because it's it's monomorphic, so probably not uh, so much of a deal with that. I assume it's uh, chaperone, and I think is what the hypothesis for it, but we're not really sure about this. Um, class one molecules exist on the outside of the MHC. Nice to know that. Uh, some functions to present the complex lipid antigens lipid antigens, notice that, to gamma delta T cells, which you remember way back when we talked about things that exist in the tissue spaces, like your skin. Um, but we don't really fully understand gamma delta T cells, so I don't think there's much point in talking about that. For class two, however, there is HLA, DP, DQ, and DR, which are going to be an doing antigen presentation. DM and DO, if you think back to whenever, if, or if you watch my video where I talked about MHC uh, type 2 peptide loading, we've already kind of talked about this, but these are intracellular uh, proteins that are going to regulate peptide loading. Uh, DM go ahead, goes ahead and increases the amount of peptide loading, and DL, I think, or DO, sorry, inhibits. I may have those uh, backwards, so double check on the last video that I've made. 
And most of the genes that are found within this class 2 region are really going to be involved in the antigen processing or presentation. Uh, for example, LMP, this is, this is the class uh, 2 regions here. So LMP, remember that? The components of the proteasome. This is the catalytic subunits of the proteasome. Uh, TAP, for example. Uh, TAP is sin. All of this stuff that we have here is, is kind of, I don't want to say that it's kind of localized to similar areas, but they do have uh, taking place in the same regions here. It's not just all MHC that's involved in it. There's other parts that are located in there. So there's more than 100 different alleles, different versions of the same gene of some class 1 and class 2 loci. A hundred different. That's insane. Each allele is present at a relatively high frequency in the population. Why? Is it because it's a selective advantage to have that? And then the chance that an individual will encode the same allele on both chromosomes is, is relatively small. I think that'd be a I mean, you'd have to determine the frequency of that, so I'm not even going to try to <laughs> try to understand that. But that's just understanding that it's small. I can't give you a a quantitative amount of expressing that. But most individuals are going to be heterozygous at these loci. The chromosomes uh, from M A and chromosome from P A, um, both for each and every one of these, um, if you remember that. Furthermore, the products of both alleles are expressed on the same cell. So if they're expressed on the same cell, we say that they are codominant, right? Which again useful to have because that gives us a selective advantage. Okay, so just like, um, well not just like, but similar to when we talked about um, the FC regions or the hypervariable loops of the uh, B cells and T cells, there are areas between the two, not from somatic recombination or somatic hypermutation, but just variation amongst the genes that contribute to areas of hypervariability. So they can differ by up to 20 amino acids. So they, they are kind of constrained to, to the fact that there is a unique structure that they have here, but they do have areas of, of variability, making each allele is pretty distinct. Most of these differences are located in the peptide binding group, which that should make intuitive sense to you. Determines the, uh, the peptide binding properties of the MHC molecule because, yeah, we're really just pointing out the obvious at this point. But polymorphism is evident by the patterns of sequence variation in the MHC molecules. For example, these anchor residues, which are shown up here in green, are most important in determining which peptides are going to bind to, to whatever. So here we see the classes here. Um, these are the areas that are associated with it, the anchor residues, and then the actual, uh, for example, source of the bound peptide. This is HIV reverse transcriptase, influenza A, nucleoprotein, uh, Ig kappa light chain, and then transferrin receptor. Um, these are both self-peptides, obviously the light chain, then transferrin, which is involved in iron uh, transport. But anyways, MHC1 mostly binds to nonomer propeptides. Um, positions 2 and 9 are the usual anchor residues here. So this is, for example, showing this, the MHC molecule here. There's the N-terminus, there's the C-terminus, there's the positions here that we have associated with this. Now, I've already kind of talked about that, right? That, that they've already can only bind to nine at the largest, right? For MHC class one, and then for obviously you can see for MHC class two, it's a lot longer. And this is not even the full picture. They can be up to 20 amino acids or 25 amino acids in length. Um, but at the same time, they have specific sites that are more, uh, I guess, prone for the, uh, anchor residues and sites that are more prone for binding it than others. Anyways, so for the anchor residues for MHC2 are less defined due to the heterogeneity and the length of the bound peptide, which is why kind of just reiterating what I just talked about there for a second. Hopefully that diagram makes sense to you. Ah, clear that up. Um, so peptide binding motifs in the is the combination of the anchor residues in each and every one of these. So for this, it would be the combination of these here. It would be the combination of these here. And then that's why you're seeing this right here. We have the, the peptide binding motif here interacting with the bound peptide and then going on and showing the, I guess, the, the compatibility between these two things here. So single residue change can affect the binding, resulting in susceptibility or resistance to a specific disease, which makes sense, right? If you change the structure of your binding site, you change the function of your binding site, it may be more compatible with a specific peptide or it may be less compatible with a specific peptide. I feel like we're really just almost in an overly complicated way pointing out the obvious with this. But anyways, at least three properties of MHC molecules are affected by MHC polymorphism. So the range of the peptides that they bound to, yes, they are promiscuous, but they still have limitations to it based off of size and then overall binding affinity. 
The conformation of that bound peptide, um, we didn't really talk about this so much, but understanding the length of it, the uh, binding associations that are involved in this, and then the interaction of the MHC molecule directly with the T cell receptor because, yeah, that's, that's important, right? CD4 versus CD8 uh, reactions there. And a T cell recognizes the peptide antigen when the bound by a particular MHC allelic variant and will not recognize the same peptide bound to another MHC molecule. This is something known as MHC restriction. Okay, so let's kind of go into depth here. So we, here we see a T cell. Here we see an antigen presenting cell. Okay, so this is the peptide labeled X, okay, for whatever reason. Um, this is going to interact pretty well with it because X is the peptide associated with that. But if we were to change the MHC complex with this, okay, not the peptide, changing the MHC complex, it will not bind. The under, if you don't learn anything, know that the T cell, the T cell receptors, and the co-receptor, but it's just the T cell receptors themselves. You could take out the co-receptor and this would still work. They interact with both the peptide and the MHC. So let's just talk about this. So the T receptors, it needs both the MHC and the correct peptide. Both of them are needed, right? So Likewise, if we have the same receptor site, but we have a different peptide, it's not compatible with that. Think about how complicated, think about how diverse the T cell receptor site is. This is a highly selective process. This is a highly specific structure that's going to bind to a very specific um, a peptide and a very specific MHC molecule. Hopefully I've driven that point home well enough. So all of this is just showing you is that natural selection is happening in the immune system and it's happening with regards to the major histocompatibility complex. Um, the, the two types of selection that you may want to know is the balancing selection. This is where we have, for example, if you remember from uh, Dr. Well, the general biology professor who taught population ecology, if you have balancing selection, the average uh, phenotype average wild type phenotype is preserved. So the graph becomes a little bit more narrow. Uh, and that's what you see with population uh, periods of a selective pressure. So successive epidemics. Um, let me switch to a color that you can actually see. Successive epidemics, for example, uh, cholera would be a good example of this. Heterozygotes that are going to survive with this because they're able to adapt anyways. They're already there, right? So over time, if we keep adding selective pressure, then that that median is going to start to get more sharply declined and it's going to be more narrowed. The graph is becoming more narrow if we were to look at it that way. So we have very weak selection right now with medicine or if you're a Corian and you're living on a ship <laughs> and it's sterile. And then when we have a new epidemic, a new infectious agent, uh, something new such as HIV, which you know how I feel about that. But anyways, let's just use this as an example. We're gonna go from the average here to favoring one type of extreme phenotype in this context. And the same thing applies to MHC molecules. So we're gonna go ahead and, and the graph is gonna move, I guess, a little bit further to the left. And then despite the strong selection, all four halotypes are going to be present in the surviving population, right? It, it's not, and the reason that I don't like these talking about this is because we're talking about things from a standpoint of one pathogen and one population, and we're not taking into account things like humans. Like, we mix our populations a lot. I can get on a plane and go to Pyongyang if I want to. I would never do that, but I'd rather go to Japan. But anyways, th that's, that's the point of that. All right, so let's talk about the gene structure and then the variation. And so... Um, this variation comes from gene families and then lastly genetic polymorphism. And the one thing that I want to make about these is that these genes are conserved, right? They don't change, um, the structure of the genes don't change so much. They're, they're pretty well retained. They don't have a whole lot of recombination taking place between them. But the advantage is that we have a huge amount of genes that we can use to pick to use for our MHCs. So the gene families that we have are for MHC class 2 and then MHC class 1. So just to reiterate what a gene family is, this is where you have many similar genes that are for both MHC, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and branch them all out as together as MHC2, um, alpha and beta chain, and then just the heavy chain for MHC1 because remember the beta 2 uh, microglobulin is not involved in, in, in this so much. The alpha chain, the beta chain, and I'm just going to go ahead and call it the heavy chain. It's the alpha 1, 2, and 3, but I just like to think of it that way for MHC class 1.
So just in case you don't remember from genetics, genetic polymorphism is where we have more than one wild type uh, genes that can, can give us this associated uh, features here. So let's go ahead and put these two together and talk about how gene families and genetic polymorphism can come together to contribute to the major histocompatibility isotopes. So obviously there's um, really just three categories that I'm going to mention here, but I'm just going to go ahead and talk about the first two kind of together. As you can imagine, MHC1 and MHC2. For MHC1, we have those that are polymorphic, oligomorphic, and then monomorphic. For the ones that are polymorphic, these are the ones that are really involved in um, interacting with the CD8 uh, cytotoxic T cells, right? So these are the ones when we think about the uh, at the 30,000 feet, what MHC class 1 proteins do, this is what we're talking about. The oligomorphic ones though, um, slightly kind of a less thing that we really haven't talked about in too much, these are involved with interacting with natural killer cells and if you think back to my video that I made or you watch the video I made on natural killer cells, it's not just MHC1 that contributes to natural killer cells decisions, whereas with, with CD8, because they're oligomorphic, and that should give you some hints to the, the structures and the peptides that they're going to be presenting. But because CD8 is polymorphic, obviously that's the determining factor for whether or not CD8 has a response to this or not. And then lastly, the one that's monomorphic, um, there's only one of them. We kind of talked about it a little bit on the PowerPoint slides, but this is hypothesized to act as a chaperone. And this was HLAF1. So I'm just going to say HLA F. And we think that this is a chaperone. Possibly. We haven't really figured that out yet. We're still investigating it. So for MHC class 2, just like with this, there's polymorphic, oligomorphic, and monomorphic. So just like over here, well, the polymorphic uh, isotypes of MHC class 1, these are the ones that are involved in antigen presentation to the CD4 helper T cells, right? The oligo ones, these are the ones that are going to be associated with peptide loading. And then for monomorphic, I'm not even going to really talk about that so much because we haven't really, the book doesn't really divulge too much in that. Now, there is something else that we need to mention here, and I'm going to see if I can kind of stretch it out through this over here the, as the halotypes. All right, so what is a halotype? Halotype is where we have a particular combination of the HLA, or you can think of it as the MHCs in human, uh, alleles that are all found on chromosome 6. A combination of these, right? Alleles, right? Um, I know I spelled that wrong, but I don't have any eraser with me. So anyways, that's how that works. Um, this tends to have a really, really, really low uh, recombination frequency, so low recombination. They don't do crossing over very much. Um, these, like I said, these are relatively conserved type structures here. Uh, but one of the things that you may want to notice here is that I'm talking about this is happening here. The halotypes are all on chromosome 6. I don't think it's important that you know specifically that it's chromosome 6, but for other things though, like for example the invariant chain or the uh, beta-2 macroglobulin, those are on different chromosomes. Those are on, I'm just going to say, chromosome 15 and chromosome 5, both, for example, 15 contains the beta-2 macroglobulin and chromosome 5 contains the invariant chain, which does play a role in this, but is not obviously <laughs> functionally involved in the process of antigen presentation or mounting of an immune response. So hopefully that can hopefully just provide some order and some clarity to what we're talking about here.